When you and I, people without superpowers, move to high altitudes, even in us, our body shifts Good afternoon friends! In this video you will learn about mutant human populations. People that have superpowers that other people don't. People who have evolved to survive at high altitudes over thousands of years. In this video we're going to survey three of these groups that live on three different continents. But before we do, please subscribe to the channel if you're not already, like the video and comment on the video to help the channel's growth. Now let's get started. Now the reason I'm making this video is not just because it's fun to talk about people with superpowers and it's also fun to talk about about genetic variation in my opinion although not everybody agrees but there's also another reason there's a practical reason I've been curious about the effects of high altitude living on health high altitude living as we learned recently can protect you from lung cancer it can also worsen your incidence of cardiovascular disease or skin cancer there are many other detailed effects that we'll survey later but in studying this subject I discovered that there were people who had adapted to living in high altitudes that didn't experience some of the health defects that others did and I realized that if I studied their genes I might be able to see sort of the footprint of our environmental stimulus to change in these people, not in us of course, I don't have the superpower, but in the people who did change, you can sort of see the footprint of how the world uh, influenced them to change. And so in that way, we could sort of read into maybe what the adaptations are necessary to live better at high altitudes, to know how we wouldn't have been adapted to it and how living at high altitudes may affect our health in the long term. And I think this will also give people who are hobbyists in mountaineering or climbing or fond of high altitude living or people living in Colorado, something to think about. Now let's get started. First of all, there are have been many human populations that lived at 3,000 meters above sea level but there haven't been many who lived at 4,000 meters above sea level or who did so for very long in fact there are three populations we know who lived that high above sea level specifically these are the Tibetans the native Andeans and the Ethiopians these three populations over thousands of years developed genetic variation that they selected for that protected them from high altitudes in similar and different ways but before we go into each of them, let's talk about what are the common pressures of living at high altitudes. Well, first of all, there's a lot of pressure on pregnancy and childbirth. As we discovered earlier, pregnant women's health is worse at higher altitudes, and so is the health of children. They're born unusually small. They also grow slower through adolescence. So there's a lot of pressure in early life. At high altitudes, we also have worse exercise capacity. VO2 max declines by about 25% between 3,000 to 4,000 meters above sea level. We also have worse lung function, specifically due to the reduced oxygen oxygen levels called hypoxia. Hypo is a little bit and then there's the oxia from oxygen. So hypoxia means low oxygen levels. Due to hypoxia, our lungs develop something called pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary just means in reference to the lungs. This is also called chronic mountain sickness. There's a lot of pressure on the lungs at high altitudes. And finally, there's also pressure on the heart and the cardiovascular system in general. So these stimuli that are common between high altitude living groups cause some changes in the long term to become selected for in these groups. Let's begin with examining the Tibetans. Now the Tibetans are most related to the Han Chinese from whom they diverged about 9,000 years ago but they also have Central and Southeast Asian related DNA. They also have Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA. For those of you that don't know about Neanderthals and Denisovans, these are archaic hominids that humans actually mated with. In the case of Neanderthals, this was mainly Neanderthal men mating with human women. In fact, some academics think that Neanderthals were raping human women because our inheritance from Neanderthals is so lopsided on the male side. In fact, our most recent common ancestor on the male side is about 10 times older than our most recent common ancestor on the female side. Now as a side note, you may have heard of people called Sherpas in relation to people climbing Mount Everest. Sherpas are Nepalis that are similar to the Tibetans. They are actually Tibetan highlanders from Eastern Tibet that migrated to Nepal in the 16th century. That's about 500 years ago. Although they've only been separated from the Tibetans for 500 years, they do have genetic variation from the Tibetans but are usually treated in research as belonging to the same class as the Tibetans, though there is some variation. Now among Tibetans, the genes that are most selected for lie in a pathway called the hypoxia inducible factor pathway, HIF. This is a very important pathway for our health and something to learn about here and pay attention to in future videos. In this pathway, 
The Tibetans have polymorphisms that improve the function of HIF-alpha, a subunit of HIF in particular. Some of these polymorphisms have actually been inherited from the Denisovans, the non-human relatives of the Tibetans. Polymorphisms here, in particular at the genes EGLN1 and EPAS1, are responsible partly for the reduced incidence of pulmonary hypertension among these Tibetans. They have less high blood pressure in their lungs because they have less hypoxia because they're able to manage oxygen better in their body because of the hypoxia-inducible factor pathway. EGLN1 and the PKLR gene are also partly responsible for the reduced hemoglobin among Tibetans. You see, Tibetans don't have high hemoglobin in their blood partly because of increased affinity for oxygen as well as other reasons. Now, as I don't want this video to get uh, tedious and boring, I'm not going to keep listing genes, but there are other polymorphisms that are very interesting in the vascular system of the Tibetans and also in heme metabolism. But let's move on to the Andeans. The Andeans have been genetically isolated for a very long time. In fact, the amount of European DNA that they have is inversely associated with their exercise performance at higher elevations. Now, these Andeans have selected for variants that are similar in some ways to the Tibetans. For example, they have variants at EGLN1 involved in the cardiac response to low oxygen levels. They also have selected for variants in the cardiovascular system that don't necessarily fall in the hypoxia pathways, the natural pathways our body deals with to respond to low oxygen environments. But they also have some differences. For example, the Andeans have selected for polymorphisms at the NOS2 gene. That is the gene that codes for nitric oxide synthase. As you guys know, that dilates blood vessels. Now, as with other mountain mutants, the Andeans have selected for genetic variants that alter their inflammatory status, very tellingly, some of which improve their oxidative defense, but one of which is very interesting. One is a, it codes for a truncated form of the NF-kappa B receptor. For those who have been following the channel for a while, you've heard of that receptor. That receptor modulates a lot of in, uh, inflammatory gene transcription in the body. For example, people who supplement with sulforaphane and many other healthful supplements are mainly doing that to reduce the activity of the NF-kappa B receptor. Well, these Andeans have a receptor that doesn't function very well. So they have less inflammation in general. And of course, they have other variants in the vascular system. Now, moving on to the Ethiopians. Now, unfortunately, I love Ethiopia and I love the history of Ethiopia and the genetics of Ethiopia, so I wanted to mention them. But they are very poorly studied. They have some different genetic variants, a lot of which lie in the hypoxia pathway, but they're still being studied. They're not very well understood, and to be honest with you, there's not much point spending too much time getting into the details of their genetics. Next, let's talk about how these three groups have different phenotypes, beginning with their blood. You see, the Tibetans and the Ethiopians have some remarkable differences from the Andeans. When we go to high altitudes, our hematocrit and hemoglobin get affected. In particular, our hemoglobin rises to try to give us enough oxygen. This happens also to the Andeans, but much less so to the Tibetans and the Ethiopians. Among the Tibetans and the Sherpas of Nepal, their VO2 max, which is improved at high altitudes, is associated with their blood viscosity and this reduced hemoglobin content. But they do have slightly elevated hemoglobin amounts, but their plasma is also elevated to match it so that their blood viscosity doesn't, their blood doesn't get too sludgish. That's how you can visualize it. And this allows them apparently to perform much better at higher altitudes. But fascinatingly, the Andeans don't have this incredible protective effect, but still have good health at higher altitudes due to their differing genetic selection. Next, let's look at how their pregnancies differ. A few videos ago, we discovered that pregnant women in Colorado had worse health as pregnant women, and that their babies were born unusually small. Does this happen to Andeans and Tibetans? Not quite. Their babies are protected, but in different ways. Both the Andeans and Tibetans share increased uterine artery thickness. That means that essentially the blood vessel development to the uterus is more robust, but they have some differences. The Tibetans have a higher placental weight relatively to the child. Whereas Andeans have, for example, higher estrogen levels when they're pregnant, potentially a safeguard against hypertension because estrogen dilates the blood vessels. Interestingly, by the way, the Andeans have uh, polymorphisms in the AMP kinase-related gene, alpha-1 specifically. The AMP kinase-related gene, that's one of the pathways I'm most interested in personally and the pathway that metformin uses to extend our lives. And there are other differences between the Andeans and Tibetans in their phenotypes. For example, the Andeans even look different. They have short limbs and large torsos, most likely to have larger lungs that can 
can have a larger relative size compared to their bodies. Tibetans don't experience this. Next, let's talk about how they're similar. You see, the Tibetans and the Andeans share 31% of the SNPs that they selected for, the exact same SNPs. That means that they were selected for separately in separate contents, in separate populations, the same SNPs. So these 31% are SNPs that are very informative. For example, the EGLN1 gene that does affect their hemoglobin concentrations and hypoxia inducible factor alpha expression in muscle. Genetic polymorphisms at that gene are selected for among the Tibetans, among the Andeans, among the Dagestanis. Dagestanis are a Caucasian population that lives in Europe that they don't live in quite the elevation that these guys do, but they are adapted to their elevation. I think their elevation must be around 2,500 meters, something like that. The Dagestanis also have selected for EGLN1, and some Indian populations that live at high altitudes have also selected for EGLN1. What other commonalities do these populations have? One is vascularization. For example, VEGFA, V-E-G-F-A, that's vascular endothelial growth factor A. The polymorphisms in that gene are selected for both in the Tibetans and in the Andeans. And in fact, when people, normal people without superpowers like me and you, go to high altitudes, we increase our expression of VEGFA. So VEGFA is likely very important for the adaptive responses to high altitude living. But they also both share changes in their inflammatory gene expression. For example, both the Andeans and Tibetans have polymorphisms at the IL-6 gene. That's codes for interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is an inflammatory cytokine modulated by your immune system. It's partly responsible for inflammation in our vascular structure. In fact, when people live at high altitudes, expression of IL-6 increases and is thought to be partly responsible for cognitive decline in normal people living at high altitudes. Another commonality that these populations have is selection for genes that affect their lipid metabolism, in particular the PPAR alpha gene. This is related to a, to a different receptor that is agonized by telmisartan. For those watching this video that take telmisartan, this is in that class of receptors. That receptor is the gamma receptor. Cardarenes is the PPR delta receptor. This is the PPR alpha receptor. You see, when you, when you and I, people without superpowers, move to high altitudes, even in us, our body shifts from a fatty acid oxidation preference at rest toward glycolysis, which means we prefer to burn glucose or sugar instead of fat when you go to high elevations. Well, the polymorphisms that have been selected for among Ethiopians and Tibetans at PPR alpha does the same thing. It encourages them to be more in a glycolytic state, burning sugar. But this is not even the most fascinating part of the commonalities that they share. There's a very mysterious and curious commonality that they almost all share, which is polymorphisms in the alcohol dehydrogenase related genes. That is genes that encode for enzymes that metabolize ethanol, alcohol. The Andeans, the Ethiopians, and the Tibetans, as well as actually the Sherpas, and the Sherpas differ from the Tibetans in some of these polymorphisms, but all four of them have developed polymorphisms that improve their ability to metabolize alcohol. Why? This is a very curious issue. When I came across this initially in the research papers, being a former alcoholic myself, I was fascinated. I wondered, is it possible that across three continents, everybody that moves up in elevation just starts drinking? It isn't. What appears to be the case is that maybe the contents of our microbiome and our intestines change. Maybe the species in particular change. That's what academics think. Maybe species that metabolize more ethanol are more frequently found in people that live in high elevations. And in order to survive, these people had to be able to metabolize ethanol better. Anyway, something like that is certainly happening. It's not drinking because animals also have this preference for selecting for enzymes that degrade alcohol. All kinds of animals like antelopes, sheep, uh, cows, even the horses that were brought to the Andean mountains about four or five hundred years ago have already developed polymorphisms selected for among them that improve their enzymatic digestion of alcohol. So it's probably unlikely that these high altitude living people were just getting drunk up there. Otherwise their animals would probably have needed to also in order to get this adaptation. Anyway guys, let's try to conclude our video with some key takeaways. First, it took thousands 
thousands of years for these populations to develop the intricate adaptation to living at high altitudes such that they don't experience the health issues that we would at high altitudes. Something for people that want to climb Everest to keep in mind that Sherpa has different genes than you and he's going to respond to that altitude different than you. You're probably going to suffer for it later in life much more than he will. Second, these groups across three continents have converging genetic polymorphisms that developed independent of each other in the exact same genes, in the sometimes the same SMPs. But they also have differences. Some of these most startling differences can be found when you compare, for example, the Andeans and Tibetans. We can't really compare the Ethiopians fully yet because they haven't been studied so well. But when you look at the Andeans' blood compared to the Tibetans or even their physicality, they are quite different, despite sharing 31% of the same SMPs chosen for separately. Now let's review what were these adaptations that these groups had in common. One was a change to the anatomical structure of the lungs. One was improved or altered vascular connectivity. They all exhibited genetic selection that would improve or lessen the level of inflammation that they experienced at these high altitudes. They all shared polymorphisms that would alter their ability to carry oxygen in their blood. Some while exhibiting lower hematocrit and some not. They also all shared polymorphisms that affected their ability to burn sugar instead of fat. And finally, they all shared polymorphisms that improved their ability to metabolize ethanol or alcohol. Anyway, friends, I hope you found this video interesting. We'll take a break from this high altitude series for a little bit so it doesn't get too repetitive. But soon I want to talk about the health effects of living at high altitudes for normal people. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning.